okay, I'm um, going to talk today about climate change and like I told the first group, I'm going to make the punchline first and there's a reason for that. There's this topic, for better or worse, is in the news frequently, um, has become part of a political debate, my perspective unfortunately. But I do want to emphasize that this issues related to climate change will ultimately be decided by the science. They will not be decided by debates on Fox News and CNN. They will not be decided by proclamations by our president and our Congress. They will not be decided by an argument in your living room. They will be decided because the, the earth does not listen to any of those folks. They will be decided by the best scientific information we have available. And right now, the best scientific information we have available, um, which is not perfect, I'll admit, but when deal with issues of climate change, I think the statements of 11 presidents of national academies carries as much weight as anything can carry. So I'm not going to talk about the politics of climate change, but I will say, based on the best of our knowledge of the work of literally thousands of people over the better part of 100 years, um, we can pretty confidently say that climate change is real. I'm not going to read that statement to you, but I do want you to realize that the climate is changing. It always has, but the big difference now is the rate of change is probably faster than that observed during most of civilization. And we are pretty confident that the reasons for the change are primarily linked to the release of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by fossil fuel combustion. So I will start with that. Um, I, that's not a point of debate. From my perspective, the science tells us that, and that's been confirmed by the leaders of these national academies. Not confirmed, but it is their informed opinion that that statement is correct. So now let's, let's step back and let's talk about what is climate. And I think to many people we need to differentiate climate from weather. When we talk about climate, the simplest answer is climate is the average weather. But a slightly more sophisticated answer is climate is the statistics of weather at a location. And by statistics, we not only mean the average weather, but all the things related to that, the hottest and coldest. You hear it on the news every night when they tell you you've had a record high or a record low or a record year of rainfall or snowfall. Those are part of the statistics. So what, what do you mean by weather? Well, what, is it raining outside now? Well, it was raining this morning. The weather has changed. It's clear now, or at least it was when I stepped outside between things. Um, how warm is it outside? There's a snowstorm maybe in Reno. That's weather. When climate is, we say, what's the average temperature in Pleasanton for July? Or, you know, how much snow is going to fall at your favorite ski resort? You can take a guess. The ski areas need to know what they can expect in forms of snow, whether they're going to make snow or rely on natural snow for their operations. Then we had a flood up in the wine country, and you know, one of the things one says, well, what are the chances, if I'm a, a vineyard owner or I own a house near the river, what are the chances this is going to happen next year? Well, climate statistics will tell us the chance of that happening again next year. That's the difference between weather and climate. Here's a, a kind of a picture of a difference. Um, we look at, this is, the average precipitation for a 30-year period over the United States in July versus one year's rainfall in July. And you can see in this year, 1993, there's almost no rain in July in all of California, what we would call a mini drought in many parts of the Southwest. But on average, we do get some rain. And you can see the same year there was a lot of heavy rain in the Midwest. But on average, they don't get that much rain. So this is a different, this is cumulative weather for a month. This is climate. Okay, we'll talk about what determines the climate. Climate is 
Very simply, an energy budget. The sun transfers energy to the Earth, and the Earth emits energy back out to outer space. And all the processes that go on in this determine the Earth's climate. The thing that complicates life is that the heating and cooling is unevenly distributed and changes minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day in this heating and cooling between the surface and outer space. And that's what causes weather and ocean circulations. So the ocean and the atmosphere account for this uneven distribution of heating and cooling by moving heating around, moving heat around to balance the uneven distribution. All the energy in the climate system comes from the sun. We all know we go out on a sunny day, the sun heats you up, so it heats the earth up too. And on average over a year, this is what happens to the sunlight that the earth receives. About a third of it is reflected back out to space and about two thirds stays in the system. Now what's important is that this, all these things that determine these various arrows and the processes are what make weather and climate. And remember, these are averages, and they're not happening at any given time. Now, we all know that the sun heats the earth and warms us up, but we don't know that's quite as obvious as how the earth cools. And the earth cools by emitting infrared radiation back out to space. And Mr. Marson has a demonstration that will show you that every object emits radiation, and most objects around our temperature emit infrared radiation, including you, including that piano, including that pail of water. Everyone's used a thermometer, and the thermometers work because um, the molecules of air that this thermometer is currently, currently immersed in have an average kinetic energy and by, by jostling one another and jostling the thermometer, eventually the kinetic energy is transferred to the fluid inside. Those molecules expand. Most people probably understand that. Okay, but to make this work, I'm going to have to immerse it in the medium that I want to measure. So uh, I have to have it in contact with the air molecules or if I want to use the speaker here, I'd have to have it in contact with the water inside the beaker. Okay, that's conduction. However, when we're talking about the Earth radiating energy, we're not talking about the typical um, bumping from molecule to molecule. We're talking about energy being released as a wavelength, infrared, slightly longer than visible light. And you need a different instrument. So what I have here, and this will try, I'll try to show you here. Not bad. Okay, this reads the infrared radiation being emitted from this beaker. The speaker is radiating energy. So if I hold the button down, it tells me that the water inside the beaker is reading 18 and a half degrees. So it takes the infrared radiation and it converts it into something I understand, which is temperature. Okay, um, something that is Something that's very cold, like ice, emits radiation as well. So if I try to put this like that, it's telling me seven and a half degrees. Now that's obviously not quite right, but then I'm a few centimeters away from the ice cubes, and so it's going to be a little bit off. But what it's telling me is infrared radiation is being released there. So the Earth emits infrared radiation to outer space. It's not molecule to molecule, it's just energy escaping. Okay. okay, now you understand that sun comes in and heats the earth and the earth emits infrared radiation back out and these are about in balance. Well these are in balance if you average over periods of about a few weeks to several years. So just look at it from two satellite pictures. 
This is energy in. This is sun coming in, heating the earth. This is the western hemisphere, and these are two satellite images in the visible and infrared spectrum taken at the same time. You see, this is North America. This is the west coast of North America. Mexico's down here. And then you see that nightfall is happening in the east coast, is in the shadow, and it's dark. So the energy coming in is all in this region, and the darker areas are absorbing because they don't reflect as much light, are absorbing the sun's energy in the lighter areas like clouds and down at the ice down at the poles, up at the pole, are reflecting some of it, but they're still absorbing the sunlight. Now this is, what I've done is reversed, this is basically a, a negative image of what you see on a Weatherman satellite at night because I wanted to show that the brighter areas are emitting more radiation. This is an infrared image and you can see that the areas that are brighter are emitting more infrared radiation and cooling basically to space or losing energy to space. And so these dry land areas, they're the warmest and so they emit the most radiation. The ocean's about this constant. And then these dark areas are clouds which are high in the atmosphere and are colder so they don't emit as much radiation. And here, and you notice the western part of the U.S is warmer than the central part, and that's because this tends to be wetter than the west. So we have energy coming in and energy coming out. As you can see, there's a lot of spatial variability about this. It's not all even like it was in that nice cartoon. Okay, now I want to talk about greenhouse gases. Um, greenhouse gases, what they do is, as the Earth's surface emits some of this infrared radiation, they absorb it and release heat to the air. That's what a greenhouse gas does. The primary greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, ozone, and water vapor. And there are several other ones that are in smaller concentrations, which actually, if they were in concentrations as large as CO2 and water vapor, would have a much bigger effect but these are the primary ones that are important for climate work. Now CO2 is evenly distributed throughout the troposphere, the lower part of the atmosphere, and I'll show you a picture of that in a few minutes. And it's slowly increasing. Water vapor is highly variable. As we know, you could go out, it's dry one day, it's humid the next. That's the result of how much water vapor is around you. It's variable in space and time, but the total in the atmosphere overall is nearly constant. And ozone is nearly constant in the stratosphere, but it's highly variable in the troposphere, and that's because um, it reacts when it touches water molecules, of which there are a lot in the troposphere. It reacts when it touches surfaces. So ozone doesn't have what we call a long lifetime. An ozone molecule won't last very long in the troposphere, although there are sources to create more of them, and then when it touches something, they tend to get destroyed. But most of these... Um, sources are from human activities, although there are some natural ones, but ozone's not nearly important in the, in the troposphere. It doesn't affect the climate, ener the energy budget that much in the troposphere, but it does in the stratosphere. But we're, I don't want to go into a whole thing about ozone in the stratosphere. That's really not part of this talk. So let's talk about the uh, average energy budget for the Earth. This is over a year, and what we have I'm going to look at the, just look at the top part of the figure. You have the sunlight coming in, heating the earth, and you've got the infrared radiation going out, which is cooling it. About 342 watts per square meter comes in from the sun. Some of it's reflected right away from clouds, from small particles in the atmosphere, and is reflected to the surface, and this is primarily from ice. Then, 168 watts per square meter is actually absorbed at the surface, and another 67 watts per square meter here is absorbed by the atmosphere. This causes these, the atmosphere and the surface to be heated. Now, the Earth's surface then transfers some of this heat, that it, energy that's absorbed as heat, to back to the atmosphere and thermals. This is just the ground heating the air above it. The other way the surface transfers energy back to the atmosphere is water's evaporated at the surface. And when it evaporates, it absorbs energy. And then when it condenses as a cloud, it releases that energy and actually warms the atmosphere. So that's a different way in which energy is transferred from the surface to the atmosphere. 
Then we have what's called the infrared part of the, of the energy budget. And this is where greenhouse gases have the primary effect. Um, the surface, because it's warm, emits radiation, infrared radiation up. Some of it goes all the way out to space. But most of it is actually absorbed by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And then those greenhouse gases then emit infrared radiation both out to space and back to the surface. So this is a very complicated part of the energy budget where we spend a lot of our time, and that's where greenhouse gases have the biggest effect. The other big thing, difference is between the, in these two budgets is on average, more sunlight comes in in the tropical region. So this is the bottom part of the scale's latitude. So zero is the equator, 90 is the south pole, 90 north is the North Pole. So more, the Earth absorbs more solar radiation in the tropics and emits more infrared radiation near the poles. So we have this difference. We have a positive difference here and a negative difference here. So you have to move energy from the poles, I mean from the tropics to the poles in order to balance the heat budget. And that's what weather and ocean circulations do, as they move this energy around. So let's look at the atmosphere. And this is how it moves this energy around. Some very simple concepts which almost everybody knows. Warm air rises, cold air sinks, because warm air is less dense. Water absorbs heat when it evaporates and melts. It releases heat when it condenses and freezes. Now all these motions that happen while this air starts moving due to these temperature differences are influenced by the Earth's rotation, which makes what we call weather and storm systems and things like that. But the atmosphere tends to adjust on the scales of minutes to a few weeks. It doesn't take long for an imbalance in the atmosphere to get for the adjustments to make it. The ocean, on the other hand, Ocean circulation is resolved from differences in both temperature and salinity. So it's a little bit more complicated, even though the water is warm. The other thing is ice is less dense than water. Warm water is, more, is less dense than cold water. So water has this odd property that its density increases as it gets colder until it gets to 4 degrees C, and then its density starts to decrease again as it gets even colder than that. We all know that ice floats. So warm, salty water rises, cold, fresh water sinks. And these motions are also influenced by the Earth's rotation. Now, the time scale for an adjustment of a, of a heat imbalance of the ocean is on the order of a few days to many centuries. So its time scales for reacting to these imbalances are much longer. Now, to make up that pole to equator difference, about 40% of the difference is done by ocean transport of heat. And the rest is done by atmospheric transport of heat to make up those differences. But remember, the atmosphere, why things are variable between one summer and the next, and one season to the next, is because the ocean takes much longer to adjust. So there's changes in the way the ocean does the adjustment, causes the changes from year to year. And we have a couple more demonstrations now of some of these ideas. Well, one of the things I want to show you, and this is a kind of a dramatic de demonstration of cold water sinks, warm water r rises. Um, same with air, of course. I have some I little icebergs here, I guess. Okay, they're dyed red. Okay, I can't, you can't see them, let's put it down there. Okay, they're, they're dyed red. And I'm gonna place them in, hopefully gently, into this container of fairly still water. And we're going to let that do its thing for a second. This is an uncooperative iceberg. <coughs> And you can see, as the ice melts, the cold water that results is falling quickly to the bottom of the, the flask. 
or the beaker rather, and if I were to move this, trying to get it sort of where it's not right against the side, okay, um, as it goes to the bottom, what, what actually happens is that it mixes with the bottom water and becomes a more, it more diffuses into the rest of the, so this is exactly what happens in the ocean as, as uh, ice melts, that cold water drops. Okay, it's just a fairly, fairly straightforward thing. Um, I might also mention that the reason, of course, that, that, um, that cold air is more dense than warm air, or cold water is more dense than warm water, is the fact that the molecules are more closely packed together. Um, because warm molecules have more energy and therefore tend to take up more space. They tend to travel greater distances and take up more space. So that's, uh, that's a little demonstration number one. It's, I'm gonna sort of leave that for now. And I'm gonna ask for my two volunteers that I arranged. Okay. And they've, um, they volunteered to be under considerable pressure up here in a painless demonstration. If I could get you to stand right in front, please. Yep. And this is, uh, this is everyone's experienced this, and so it's not gonna be dramatically different, but it's gonna make a point. So you need to get your hands wet. It's just water, okay. I, I promise. <laughs> okay. All right, so the hands are wet. And we're going to put, I'm gonna pull out my trusty hair dryer. Okay, so if you hold your hands up a little bit. Okay, I'm going to ask you, what did you feel? Um, it was kind of cold. It was kind of cold. Okay, was that the, the air from the hair dryer um, was kind of cold. Yeah. It okay. It wasn't exactly what you would expect from a hair dryer, I guess. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> we're gonna. I'm gonna continue. We're gonna. I'm gonna continue with this discussion just briefly here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> now, the air from the hair dryer actually wasn't cold. Um, I pushed that little special button that says this room temperature air. What was cold was the fact that water was evaporating from the surface of their hands and it requires energy to evaporate water, uh, to turn water from a liquid into a gas, which is the most dramatic thing is if you're taking uh, swimming in PE in late March and you get out of the pool and it's a little breezy, uh, you feel very cold. Okay, and if evaporation requires energy, then condensation, which is the reverse process, turning water vapor into liquid water, is going to release energy. And those are two very important concepts. The reverse, those, those reverse processes. Okay? Okay, I want to talk about how the ocean, I'll spend just a little bit of time talking about how the ocean moves this heat around. And what it does is it absorbs the energy from the sun in the tropics, moves it poleward, and then in, North, in the North Atlantic, just like the ice cube in the beaker, there's the Arctic Ocean, which has ice that melts on its edges and also runoff from glaciers in Greenland and um, North America, put fresh water in, and that water runs off and sinks. So that cold water sinks and is replaced by this warm water coming up from the tropics. This is the Gulf Stream, which is why the east coast of the U.S., you can go swimming for hours in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, but you go to Half Moon Bay, you're gonna be cold real fast because they don't have a Gulf Stream off the, there. So that's how the ocean, now the ocean takes a long time to do this. Some of these return circulation takes hundreds of years. So there's some variability in these currents the other place water sinks is around Antarctica as um, both sea ice and some glaciers down there melt. The water sinks just like in that beaker and it's replaced by warm water flowing southward. So I have a, a movie, a little movie, if I can find out how to get it on here.
Now this is a really speeded up time lapse of the ocean circulation. And you can see that why well, this is the western boundary current that we call the Gulf Stream. There's one like it in the Pacific Ocean as well. But you can see that warm water from the tropics flows up very close to the edge of the continent and to the northern part of the Atlantic. And, this, and then he just warms the air as this warm water comes up and warms the air around here. And then the, air sink, the water sinks here, then comes back and return flows below the surface. So that's how the ocean transports and moves this about 40% of this imbalance around. Let's talk about, we'll spend the rest of the time talking about the atmosphere and how it moves this heat imbalance around. And this is a cartoon of the circulation. Basically you have this cold air sliding down from the poles at the surface. And then as it gets closer to the tropical regions, it gets warmed rises up and then returns into circulation back towards the poleward regions. Now this is very idealized. This in general gives you a way of thinking about this warm air rising and cold air sinking and about the imbalance of heating between the pole and the equator. Let's talk a little bit now about the real atmosphere. The atmosphere is a very thin shell that sits on the Earth's surface. We all think of it as being very high and very deep, flying in airplanes. It's a, it's a long way. But in terms of the radius of the Earth, the depth of the atmosphere is very small. So it's just a, a very thin uh, shell of, of fluid that surrounds the Earth. Now even, even thinner in, that, in this layer is the part that we're most concerned with, which is the troposphere. Troposphere contains about 80 percent of the mass of the atmosphere, even though it's in the lowest 15 kilometers. Atmosphere goes all the way up to 100 kilometers, but 80% of the mass is in the troposphere. And that's where all the weather occurs. So that's where we're going to talk about. And if we look at the troposphere, we have some interesting characteristics about it. It's mostly made up of oxygen and nitrogen, and, all the, and then a whole bunch of other gases, some of which are greenhouse gases, like carbon monoxide and water vapor. The temperature in the troposphere decreases with height. And this is because, as you saw from the energy budget, air gets heated near the Earth from the surface absorbing the energy and transferring the heat through thermals. But one interesting thing that happens because its temperature decreases with height is that water vapor from the surface, from water being evaporated, it gets lifted in these thermals, then condenses because it gets cold and releases its heat. So this is two ways in which the surface heat energy is transferred to the atmosphere. Now the interesting thing about water vapor is that you can evaporate water in one place and transport it through the winds far away before it condenses. So that's one important thing to realize with this experiment with the heating and cooling and the absorbing of heat is once you make water vapor out of water, you can move it far away before you get that heat back. And that's what the water cycle is all about. You evaporate mostly over the oceans, and then you, that water vapor is transported in wind and weather systems in the atmosphere, gets into storms and clouds, and then some of it rains out. That, makes water, that moves water from the ocean to rivers and streams. And it also, when the clouds form, they release the heat that was stored in them when the water was evaporated. And the simplest case of this, if you ever see it, is a thunderstorm. This is a single shot from a computer animation of a thunderstorm, but it shows the main concepts. You have water vapor and air mixed together. It comes in at lower levels, gets caught in one of these thermals from the, the air being heated, it rises up. As the air rises up, it cools because the temperature is, decreases with height until the water condenses. When the water condenses, it actually releases heat, which heats the air around a little bit, which makes this thermal even stronger. So what happens in a thunderstorm is the thermal gets locked in place and reinforces itself by it bringing in water vapor at the surface and turning into water up above. The other thing that happens is now you've got this high cloud and now you've got water at a much higher level in the atmosphere than you did when you started. So that's the simplest case. 
for how thunderstorms, how this heat and energy is moved around. Now this is a simulation of all these motions kind of put together. And what this is a plot of, the white areas are basically if you took all the water and water vapor and looked straight down from a satellite and then condensed it all in a spot. That's how much water you'd have. That's the white area. So the whiter something is, there's more water there is in the column. And the red areas are where it's actually raining. So you can see how the heat and water are moved around by the atmosphere. And most, you see all this stuff going on in the tropics where it's evaporating a lot of water, there's a lot of heat, and then this stuff moves into the poleward regions. You see the cold air, you, you can't see it, but you can tell by where the water is. Cold air is coming down, warm air is going northward. And you have all this stuff with precipitation. These are storm fronts, and this rain and this water being moved around, this uh, water and heat being moved around by the atmosphere. So now let's talk about climate change. So you have all this stuff going on. If the climate wasn't changing, if you averaged over a period of about 30 years, and then you averaged over a period of the next 30 years, you'd get the same statistics. But when the climate's changing, your statistics change. So let's talk about what we mean by climate change. Most of you know what a normal curve is. If you measured all the height of the students in a class and plotted them, they usually come out in a curve that looks like this, with the average height being in the middle, some kids being taller, some kids being shorter. Well, if you took temperature on, what's today, March 25th, in Pleasanton over 30 years, you'd probably get a curve that looked like this. You know, there'd be cold days, there'd be warm days, and then the average temperature. Now, what we mean by climate change is that this normal curve moves, and the average becomes warmer. If we're talking about climate warming, the average becomes warmer. And what does that mean in terms of what happens in Pleasant? It means you'll have more hot days on March 25th and fewer cold days. There's another way statistics could change if you take this normal curve and make its standard deviation bigger. What happens then is the average stays the same, but you end up with both more hot days and more cold days if you average over time, and less and fewer days that are around the average. That's called an increase in variability. But what we think is happening with the climate change caused by uh, greenhouse gas warming is both of these are changing. The curve is both moving and becoming more variable. So what that means in terms of, let's say, the simplest thing, temperature, is you have more warm days, you still have a few cold days, but you have a lot of very hot days. So this is one of the things we mean by a climate change, when the statistics change over a long time. And the thing that causes those climate changes are the changes in that energy balance and how that energy balance is altered by things that are um, controlling with the uh, composition of the atmosphere, the nature of the surface underneath. Now I'm going to talk about what we need to learn about climate change. I'm going to give you a background on what drives climate. And I think what people are most interested in now is why we have to learn and why this problem is so hard. Well, big part of this, we can't observe the system. We can't conduct a climate change experiment in a laboratory. We get only one experiment, and that's the one we're actually conducting. And we can't observe it over the time scales we need to because we can't go back and a thousand years ago put satellites in space that'll measure for a thousand years and give us the answer now. So we can't observe the system over the time scale required for us to understand it. That's the first problem. So we create numerical models that are basically simulate what can happen over many years on a computer. Now, these models become then the numerical laboratories. We can conduct experiments just like you conduct experiments in your science classes. The other problem with climate change is the effects of a small change have a huge impact from a human perspective. And I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. Um, the Earth's average surface temperature is about 13 degrees C, which is about 286 degrees Kelvin. A change of a few degrees doesn't seem like a whole lot. So you say, oh, that's not a big deal. The change, temperature changes, you know, 15 degrees a day. But a large global average temperature change of that scale does have a huge impact. 
And the third problem is we have feedbacks in this system. And a few examples are, is if we change one thing, we can change, other things change that then have an influence back on the first. And that's what we call the feedback. And a couple examples are snow, ice, cooling. And in that, we see it in ice ages, is an ice age starts, glaciers expand, sea ice expands, all of a sudden you're reflecting more of the sunlight back to space. It's not getting absorbed by the Earth. That causes the Earth to cool. The ice continues to expand. And that's called a feedback. That's a positive feedback. It reinforces a trend that started by something else. Water vapor warming is another one. If we have carbon dioxide concentrations increasing in the atmosphere. That's increasing the amount of heat absorbed by the atmosphere, which then allows it to hold more water vapor, which itself is a greenhouse gas, will then increase the temperature of the atmosphere. That's another feedback. Now, a negative feedback is high cloud cooling. As we increase more water vapor in the atmosphere, a logical conclusion is we'll make more clouds because there's more water there to make clouds. Well, those clouds will then reflect more sunlight, which will lessen the heating because less energy is getting into the system. And that will slightly cool, offset the warming effect by cooling a little. Two types of climate change that, that we need to know about. One is natural. These are things that are caused by, not by human activities. And a couple examples are volcanic eruptions. Now, the last one that had a major effect on climate was Mount Pinatubo's eruption back in the early 90s. It ejected a lot of tiny particles into the stratosphere that got very tiny particles that say suspended for many years above the troposphere and reflected sunlight back out to space. And as a result, the Earth, they could actually record a cooling for several years after Mount Pinatubo in the surface temperature records averaged over several years. Uh, another natural climate change is the actual amount of energy emitted by the sun tends to change a little bit. So the amount of energy received by the Earth changes slightly over time. It changes in two ways. One is the sun more or less stays the same, but the Earth's orbit changes over periods of tens to hundreds of thousands of years. The position of the Earth in space in relation to the sun changes. So the distribution of sunlight over the Earth changes slightly. This is a primary mechanism behind ice ages. But those occur over very, very long periods. Over shorter periods, solar output, I mean the actual amount of energy coming out of the sun tends to change over um, like sunspot cycles and things like that. And it changes a little bit at the top of, of the sun, so the amount of energy getting into the Earth changes. So where do these terms come in? Going back to this figure, let's, let's look at some, of these, at some of these changes. For change in solar output, this 342 decreases slightly. And then if we have a feedback, we'll say the snow ice feedback, well, this cools. More ice forms at the surface. So there's more reflection, so this increases. So this decreases, this increases, so your cooling accelerates until it reaches a new state. Now let's look at greenhouse gas warming. We have over here, we increase CO2. The atmosphere warms, so therefore more water evaporates and stays in the atmosphere. That increases the greenhouse gases. So what happens now? More of the energy here, more of this surface emission is trapped by the atmosphere and re-emitted back. And this is what causes surface warming, so feed, this feedback loop. So all these things just alter this energy budget. So a change in climate, the point, if you go away with no other point from this, from this talk, is that changes in climate are caused by changes in these arrows in this, in this energy budget. That's what causes climate change. Let's look at an ice age. I said that, that small changes have huge impacts. Well, 18,000 years ago, there was an ice sheet that covered the northern half of North America. Came down all the way into New Jersey, in the Midwest, in Ohio. Wisconsin was totally covered. There's Indiana right there, Illinois. It's the edge of it. The uh, Earth's surface average temperature is only four to five degrees cooler than it is today. But yet we had this huge ice sheet. So if you lived in Wisconsin, this is what your backyard looked like. So that's why I'm saying a small change has a huge difference 
in terms of human perspective. As far as the planet goes, it wasn't that much of a change. I mean, as far as the total state of the planet, it wasn't that big a difference. Now let's talk about anthropogenic climate change, or climate change caused by human activities. There's a lot of talk, and uh, one of my colleagues is sitting over there, spends a lot of time working with other parts of this, but most of the changes revolve from increases in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, which are a direct result of fossil fuel burning for energy. Concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased from 270 parts per million in the 1800s to over 370 parts per million now. That's a huge increase in a very short amount of time. And estimates of 90% of the warming that's occurred over the last 150 years, which is about a degree C, are due to this carbon dioxide increase and the uh, feedback in that infrared part of the Earth's energy budget. There's other cause, uh, human causes of, of climate change, and it's air pollution from other gases and small aerosol particles, and some of these gases actually do become aerosol particles as they mix with water vapor and clouds. But these are secondary effects to this one. But they're necessary to understand and make sure we have, when we build these models, we understand all parts of the system, so we make sure we get it right for the right reason. And for local climates, it's changes in land use plans. We know that farms have replaced forests. In some areas, there's been urbanization now as cities have replaced farms. And there's many others. Irrigated agriculture is an example, where you used to have dry soil in the summer, you now have wet soil. These will chart, cause changes locally, but won't have that big an effect on it globally. So let's look at where, we, I can already went through that, I don't need to go through it again, but just the parts that were altered, surface changes, we changed this part of the energy budget. Greenhouse gases changed this part of the energy budget. Um, changes in, in air pollution that, that may reflect, cause this part to change. So all these things, affect this energy budget. I want to focus down more on the, effect, uh, the uh, correlation between carbon dioxide increases and surface temperature changes. This is an historical record that starts at 150,000 years before today to today. And there's two lines and two vertical scales on this plot. This is the temperature change as a difference between what it is today and this is carbon dioxide concentration. So we can see over most of the last 150,000 years, the change in temperature has pretty well tracked with the change in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. Now they get this data from examining ice cores on, from glaciers and being able to find trapped bubbles inside. That's how they get the data. And they have records of temperature by, they know how much stuff was growing in things and they can measure the pollen all sorts of ways to do that. I don't have time to describe it, but it's pretty, this is an accepted thing. Now, if we just look at the last 150 years, we see the same general trend. We have this increase in concentration of carbon dioxide, the line, and then the blue and the red are the increase in temperature. So we've had temperature increase from the mid 1800s to today of about a degree, from minus a half a degree to plus a half a degree over the average over the whole period. At the same time, carbon dioxide concentrations have increased. So now let's look at, at the Earth's surface temperature. The past 140 years, kind of another version of that same plot. This is a year-to-year -year variability of the, of the bars. And this is kind of a long-term average over that. You can see things started warming, and then the slight cooling, and then a very drastic warming now since about 1970. And if we go back and look at the historical record over the last thousand years, we see that the temperature was pretty even, even though there was some variability in there. But now, and these gray lines are the best estimates of um, the standard deviation from these temperatures, or how, you know, if we're wrong, what, what could the difference be? It's possible that it was this warm. The main point for this figure is, is the rate of warming over the last century and the fact that this is now higher than anything that we've seen over the last thousand years. It's pretty dramatic evidence that led to those statements by those National Academy presidents. 
If we look at the ocean, we can see the ocean's warming as well. Now the ocean temperature changes only hundredths of a degree, but that's because it takes a lot more heat to heat the ocean up than it does air. But also because the ocean holds heat for a longer period of time and is more stable, these small changes are significant because they can be seen in the southern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, and the global ocean. So warming is happening in the ocean and in the atmosphere. Why do we care? Well, I said the small changes have huge impacts on human activity. And this is a picture that I think was on the flyer that went out from Mount Kilimanjaro. And Mount Kilimanjaro has a lot of snow on it in 1970. You can see today it has much less snow. And as the atmosphere warms and the snow line increases, gets higher elevation, there's less snowpack. Much of the world depends on water stored in snowpack for their drinking water and for irrigating their farms. So as there's less snowpack in the winter, there's less water in the summer. If you want to bring that closer to home, we can look at, at California. And I need a little bit to explain this chart. This is temperature change. And where there's a red circle, that means it's warmed since 1950. And the bigger the circle, the warmer it's gotten. So that's what this is. So there's a few blue circles, but most of this is red. And in California, most of the red is, is large. And on this side, same idea, but with snowpack. But in this case, when the snowpack gets greater, that means it's colder, so that's why the circles are blue. And the bigger the circle, that means the greater the snowpack's increased. The opposite is true with the red. A large red circle means that the snowpack has dramatically decreased. There's a lot less snowpack in the wintertime. Western U.S. depends on snowpack for its water, for both agriculture and drinking water. The snowpack is dramatically decreasing. That has a big impact on farmers, that has an impact on reservoir construction. It is important, a small change. So now what they ask researchers to do is say, okay, there's this change that's happening. What's gonna happen in the future? Is it gonna stop changing? Is it gonna change faster? Is it gonna keep changing about the same rate? And that's where the science comes in. And the first thing I would like to emphasize is this theory about carbon dioxide and surface temperature. The theory that supports this is over 100 years old. It was first postulated in 1896. And a famous chemist named Arrhenius calculated just on changing, without the feedback part, the radio transfer calculation. And he guessed that if you double the world's carbon dioxide, the uh, atmosphere's carbon dioxide concentrations, from 270 to 540 parts per million, you would get about a five to six degree C global surface temperature rise. He also said that since you're altering only the infrared part of the budget, because he doesn't have feedbacks, that, and these are things that are consistent with the theory, nighttime temperatures increase more than daytime because the Earth radiates at night and the day, but it only receives sunlight at, sunshine at, at, during the day. And because that curve for the outgoing infrared radiation was nearly flat, that the poles would be affected faster than the tropical regions. Well, the observations we have over the last several decades are consistent with this theory that's over 100 years old. So the, what do we do? We gotta figure out what's going on. So we take all the understanding and all the knowledge we have, and we build climate models to carry out these experiments to try to answer these questions. Now there's a problem with the climate model is that it's not a perfect representation of the system. If we start off with a real system, the first thing we do is we try to develop hundreds of what we call differential equations, and you don't know what that is unless you've taken a calculus class, but you'll learn someday. So that's the first thing. Then we take those differential equations and we change them into algebraic equations, because computers can't solve differential equations, they can only solve algebraic equations. Then we take those algebraic equations and turn them into a computer code. And now we, have a, now we have our laboratory built. But as we all know, when we have a laboratory, we have to then design the experiment, carry it out, and look at the results. So we then have an experimental design in our laboratory that produces a model result. At each step in this process, there are assumptions and approximations that put, introduce potential errors. So we have all these steps, 
to build a climate model. And now what happens is, if you have people that don't trust what the modelers do, they say, look at all this, these errors and assumptions you have. I, why should I believe anything you do? Okay. Well, the reason is that we have now a very good record to test the models against observations. Over the last 30 years, there's been a lot of observations that have enabled us to make very detailed measurements about both the processes that go into all weather and climate and the weather and climate average over different areas itself. Um, these are just a few examples. The biggest difference has been satellites that have been launched since the late 70s to measure all sorts of things about the Earth and give us a lot of very high quality um, information. Uh, this is a picture of the Aqua satellite which um, orbits the poles and takes images and scans the whole Earth every uh, couple of weeks. And each of these satellites has multiple instruments that measure different things. So we learn about the clouds, we learn about the surface, we learn about the atmosphere, we learn about the ocean with these satellites. The other thing we have is, this is an example of a, a remotely piloted vehicle. This thing doesn't, can stay, take measurements for um, several days without having to come down. And has instruments on it and has a package you can make, move up and down in the atmosphere and take uh, lots of measurements of lots of different things. And we have uh, one of the things the Department of Energy, and since I work for the Department of Energy Laboratory, I have to give a plug for it. Um, there's a program called the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program, which has three sites around the world, which do nothing but collect lots of measurements, and they have um, instruments that look both upward in the atmosphere and make surface measurements of what's going on. Over the past 30 years, and particularly over the last 10, there's been a rapid increase in the amount of information we have to both test the models, and then we use that information to improve them. Now, how do we use a model? Well, we can carry out these experiments. One of the reasons we think that climate has changed from human activities is this experiment. If we take the climate and we only factor in what we know about the natural changes, and we run this experiment over and over again, because the model won't give you the same answer, exact same answer every time, we get this envelope of answers about global surface temperature change, and this is the gray. So this is what the model simulations tell us will happen if we only had natural climate change. This is the actual observation of the temperature record. We can see that the actual temperature record doesn't fall in this envelope of the model results. So we think the model, this isn't the system. So then we just say, okay, let's just do the anthropogenic climate change. And once again, you see that this is actually better. The temperature falls within this gray envelope more than it did over here, but it still misses like a big piece there. Now, if you put the two together, you see that most of the time the observations fall within this envelope of these model simulations. This is what gives us confidence that we know what's causing the climate change. And that's how models are used. And as these models are further developed, they'll be used to answer questions of, if we do this, if we have this kind of energy policy, what will the climate do? That's how the models are used. So what happens next? Well, we know that CO2 concentrations will continue to increase. There's not anybody in the world who thinks that that's not going to continue to happen for the next several decades at least, and probably for the next century or so. Model simulations we have now suggest that increasing CO2 to 540 parts per million, which is a doubling of the pre-industrial levels, will read the globe, raise global temperatures from between two and four degrees about. So that guy that did 100 years of radius said five to six, he wasn't far off from that straightforward radio transfer calculation that he did. Because the models include the feedbacks, that number is slightly altered. But this number is still consistent with a 100-year-old theory in terms of its approximate magnitude. The models also give us detail about what that kind of global temperature change means in terms of particularly the hydrological cycle. The other thing we know is climate will continue to change. And one of the things that we're probably most concerned about at this time, and um, some of these feedbacks are unknown and potentially large. So we don't know the total extent of how these feedbacks kick in, and the models tell us some of it, but we're not sure we have all the processes in the models to include all of the feedbacks. Is there going to be an ice-free summertime Arctic Ocean? 
will, as the ocean heats, will the Arctic Ocean decrease in size? Therefore, there'll be more open ocean that'll absorb more heat that'll cause the Arctic to shrink more. Possible within our lifetimes, within your lifetimes, will be the search for a Northwest Passage across the Arctic Ocean and maybe an ice-free Arctic. Even more troublesome is the possibility that large glaciers and land ice will melt. And the one they're concerned about right now, and just by coincidence, three article, four articles came out in Science yesterday about this topic. If the Greenland ice sheet completely melts, sea level will rise seven meters, which will inundate all the coastal regions in the world. Um, and they're worried that this could happen within a couple hundred years, which may sound like a long time, but if you live in the southeast U.S., a couple hundred years is not time to move that many people. So this is, we don't know about these things, and we're trying to rely on models to do this. But right now, none of these mo climate models have good representations of glaciers in them. Because that's a very hard problem, because how do you validate the model to know if it's doing a glacier right, because it takes glaciers thousands of years to build and melt, and we don't have a model that, we don't have observations to, to uh, verify our model against. And just want to show you one final thing, and this is a simulation of a possible, what the model show could happen in the Arctic from just a doubling of CO2. Now this is what we call a control run. This is the experiment run without any climate forcing. This is just the energy budget stays more or less constant. And there's some variability year to year, but as you can see, as this thing goes through a 300 year period, it doesn't change all that much from year to year. This is summertime average Arctic Ocean. So it's a 300 year period. Like I said, this is a control run, like you guys do a control experiment in your science classes. Now, if we double CO2, this is what the model shows us may happen. So this red line shows the average edge of the ice in, those, in that film I showed you before. And this shows you how much it's melt back. This ice area, this is all ice free now. And this is all very thin ice. So this is a possible change that could happen from continuing increase of carbon dioxide concentrations. And with that, I'm done.